This is the DeFi Decoded Podcast by Nine Point Partners in cooperation with Prophecy DeFi. The ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast should not be taken as investment advice. Always consult with your financial advisor before investing. Hello and welcome back to another episode of DeFi Decoded. My name is Alex Tapscott. I am here with co-host Andrew Young. Andrew, we've been talking about uh, two big things the last few weeks. Number one has been the news about Tornado Cash. Uh, This is a mixer, basically an open uh, source project that allows you to anonymize crypto transactions. Uh, It's used by lots of people for legitimate reasons and uh, some would say illegitimate reasons uh, by some estimates, you know, a big chunk of this is actually used by criminals. And as a result, it's caused um, some, uh, you know, concerns. The government's shut down uh, the Tornado Cash um, URL. They have uh, sanctioned the wallet address and a lot of other participants in the industry have followed suit, uh, especially, you know, big operators like Circle, the creator of USDC. Um, That's one story. And then the other story is that uh, we're leading up to the merge, which is happening soon. And there's discussion around the merge of, you know, potential proof of work coin uh, being split out from the proof of stake chain, which is what everyone sort of expects to become the main chain for Ethereum. Um, And sort of in the discussion around both of these things has been this question of like, who's going to support what, right? So who is going to support the merge um, and, and the adoption of proof of stake? And the case of Tornado Cash, you know, who is who is going to continue to connect to Tornado Cash and who's going to Turn it off. Most people have chosen to, to turn it off. Um, behind the scenes, there are a number of you know, key stakeholders that people think about, you know, centralized exchanges, which might be delegating or staking on behalf of others. You've got, uh, you know, other sort of big parties that have had a voice in this. But one that we haven't really heard from um, are node operators. And uh, we've got a, a guest on today's show, Sharon Byrne Cotter who is, um, well, she's one of the senior people at Infura and she helps us to sort of break that down. But I think maybe before we jump into that, um, it'd be helpful to just explain like, what is a node? And um, what does a company like Infura actually do before we get into the details of these big issues that are happening? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in a crypto network, uh, a node is, is like a highly integral, integral part of, uh, of the network. Um, it essentially nodes validate transactions and they keep the network safe. Um, simply a node is a device that is part of a network of other devices. So sort of one, de- one device is one node. Uh, and so a network is essentially to be a fully decentralized network, you have to be a network of different, uh, different nodes. And this differs from sort of traditional uh, payment networks or financial networks where um, essentially the only people who can be a node, a node are the sort of underlying financial institutions. So in Visa's network, Visa is the no- all the nodes, <laughs> if there is even multiple. Um, whereas in a permissionless network, uh, anyone be- can become a node, store state, and sort of contribute to the security of the network. Um, and uh, by, for example, also sort of running a validator or a miner, which is sort of an extra part uh, on top of sort of running a node. But um, so, yeah, essentially that's, I guess that's kind of the easiest way to think about it. Um, in, a peer, in a peer-to-peer network, um, in a fully decentralized sort of peer-to-peer blockchain network, uh, it's comprised of sort of thousands of nodes uh, and yeah. you sort of run a node to be able to actually access the data directly. Um, and, uh, and then if you want, you can uh, on top of sort of uh, being a node, you can you can contribute to the security by being a validator. Uh, so what Infura does is it is quite uh, challenging and somewhat computationally expensive to sort of act as your own node. And so effectively what Infura does is it provides node as a service. Uh, it's a really easy way to sort of spin up your own node, um, which is particularly useful for sort of application developers on the network. Um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of like the, you can kind of think of it as like the going from running your own server to sort of running uh, something in the cloud. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, it's a really interesting topic because it's one of those things that um, is essential infrastructure, but is kind of unseen, uh, especially to the end user. I think to developers, application developers, you know, they would be familiar with this obviously because they um, would interact with an Infura. And in fact, Infura has, Infura has 430,000 uh, developers who 
who use their services. So it is sort of a central infrastructure, but unseen. So um, this is a great episode. We're going to sort of lift the veil here a little bit and, and look under the hood of what's really behind these decentralized networks like Ethereum. We've got this great guest. Sharon is going to be joining us in just a second. So please stay tuned and we'll have the interview next. Here she is. Hello and welcome back to another episode of DeFi Decoded. My name is Alex Tapscott here with Andrew Young. Today we are talking about crypto infrastructure and we've got an excellent guest. Sharon Byrne Cotter is Director, Partner Product and Program Manager at Infura, focused on network enablement and working across consensus, the company to strategically develop, implement and optimize partners, product solutions and services for our non-crypto uh, guests, Infura is a trusted infrastructure provider. They're really critical to the, really to the functioning of um, many crypto ne networks, Ethereum included, and uh, is used today by over 430,000 developers worldwide. They recently made an announcement where Infura was uh, partnering with Reddit, FTX Pay, and P2P, among three others, uh, for a new data um, availability community excuse me, committee for um, this thing called Arbitrum Nova, which is going to be used by Reddit. Pretty interesting. Um, Sharon, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Really nice to be here. So for the folks who are on um, listening in, can you just describe in simple terms, like what does Infura actually do in the, in the crypto ecosystem? Sure, yeah. Well, your intro was pretty good where you said Infura is infrastructure, but just to sort of drill down on that a little bit, it's... Um, Node as a service where we provide nodes to all the developer community for multiple APIs, also known as networks, and then other APIs like NFT APIs. We also, uh, being part of consensus, can offer them a collection of tools that developers can leverage like Truffle and um, diligence for auditing. So it's sort of like a bit of a one-stop shop for developers to really build quality decentralized applications for hopefully a big decentralized future. <clears throat> That's terrific. How long have you been with the company for? Well, I've been with Consensus for just over three years, but I only joined the Infura group in April of last year. So just over a year with the Infura team, but it's been going great. I really love that. And can you just describe a little bit about the relationship between Infura and Consensus and, and the Consensus, the company and the background on that group? Because I think it's a name that people hear about a lot, but uh, maybe not is not as well understood by folks, especially outside of the crypto uh, world. Sure. Well, even my role actually makes me look horizontally across Consensus. So in the mouthful that it is. Um, I'm partner product and program manager. So on the product side, I'm focusing very much on Infura and network enablement. But on the program management side, I'm working on collaborative activities across consensus. So very much working with MetaMask on, on code projects, working with Truffle, uh, Codify, Codify staking. So, a uh, consensus is a whole collection of Web3 capabilities of which Infura is one in the stack. And we're the infrastructure provider, that sort of platform for developers to build decentralized apps. Yeah. And uh, Andrew, sorry, do you, you want to jump in there? Yeah, no, I will. First of all, uh, I'm, I'm reasonably familiar with Infura. Uh, I'm a very happy customer with SX Network. Uh, we've, we've used Infura in the past. Uh, it's it's kind of seen as the, the gold standard for uh, uh, for for uh, like you said, Node as a service. Uh, but one of the things I I've always been very curious because I'm not a sort of infrastructure developer is how does uh, Infura kind of protect against attacks uh, like DDoS attacks and things like that. That how is it able to sort of maintain its high quality uh, of performance? Well, we've really robust security overall, you know, so first and foremost, we don't really suffer DDoS attacks and then we've got great redundancy because we have multiple nodes and instances to fall back on. So we're not like a monolithic waiting to be just knocked out. Um, a good example of like, um, Infura's reliability that people can trust in is its scalability. So we have loads of customers, as you pointed out. And so we have an elastic infrastructure that can really scale to meet their needs. 
And the reason that we can say scale up additional nodes more quickly is that we maintain current snapshots, you know, maybe 100 blocks or 50 blocks behind the latest um, block on chains. So when we need to add more availability, higher response, we add more nodes, we can leverage these snapshots and really scale up. So in terms of a DDoS attack, we haven't experienced that. And we have lots of redundancy in our system across our networks to tackle any such event. That's a really good question, Andrew, um, and uh, pretty specific to you know security concerns. I'm wondering maybe we could just take a step back, Sharon, um, and and talk a little bit about uh, about you for a sec, because you um, have spent time at BNY Mellon, Microsoft, and Dell, which you know are are three blue chip companies that have been around for a very long time, uh, relatively speaking, you know, decades uh, compared to Web three. <laughs> But uh, but you you made yeah. this you made this you've made this leap into Web three and I'm just wondering like because we talk a lot on the show about how D DeFi and and Web three as it gets bigger is attracting not only uh, capital and people like yourself but also partnerships and the like with large large organizations and I'm wondering like, how does your experience working for one of those big companies inform what you're doing with a group like Consensus which is pretty far from you know a Dell or, or a BMY Mellon certainly, which is one of the oldest companies in the United States. But even those yeah. other companies, yeah, no fair point. Um, well, I fell in love with blockchain and I chased a position in consensus. I sort of had the experience from tech and finance and tech in finance, so it was like a perfect storm when I discovered uh, blockchain. But to come back to your question, um, I think from working in large companies like that they're always focused on first and foremost risk then quality and then user experience so when i come to work at consensus i'm often thinking about risk have we considered our quality or quality assurance and maybe an example to illustrate that is um uh, as product manager i recently uh, released darknet as a private beta and the reason for releasing it as private data is that we restrict the number of users that can sign up. So that gives us a controlled sample as such of users. We get to really test, you know, the telemetry on our system. Is it, does it need to be dialed up or down in terms of requests per second, in terms of gas limits, in terms of how many nodes, how's our API responding? And so we get a chance to assess what does good look like and then we can set a realistic SLO that we know Infura can stand over. And then we open up uh, to what we refer to as a public beta to all of our users. So we did the same with Avalanche as well in July. So both of those are currently in private beta and hopefully in Q4, we're gonna move into public beta having done that analysis. So I think that's an example of my risk mindset and then the ability to ask customers, is this working for you in terms of user experience and getting feedback? And can you say, like, I don't know if this data is available, what, what share of Ethereum nodes um, Infura is currently operating today? Do you know? Well, I, I couldn't say because I don't know the other providers. So um, like the landscape has grown dramatically in the number of node providers. So even though Infura is a big player, it's actually a much more decentralized environment. Um, but I could not say what share, no. <clears throat> and, but what do, you, what do you think then contributes to Infura's success? Because I think Infura is pretty well known as like one of the larger node operators in, in the space. Um, uh, you know, what, what is the differentiator? Is it those, Things that you just described is it the tool set that exists on top of um, you know that base um, offering like what what are the things that that have made you guys stand out from from others in the group? Well, to be honest, I think first and foremost is it's a very young ecosystem and uh, Infura is around since twenty sixteen and has gone through the rough and tumble and learned a lot. So there's a lot of valuable experience and learning in Infura, how to manage the blockchain networks. Um, and then really the differentiators, in my opinion, is that reliability because we have built in redundancy, that elasticity where we can actually scale up networks 
uh, based on customers' demands because you do go through these cycles of fair and full, as we all know. And then I think we've got very good uh, pricing and excellent support. We've got a really good customer success team that is very responsive, giving our customers what they want. And we want to move more in towards education and supporting developers so that they have more and more information to build you know, powerful decentralized applications. If that all makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Andrew, did you want to jump in? Yeah, no, I think, um, I guess, shifting to more kind of current events, um, one of the things I was really curious was, um, like, how is Infura planning on supporting the upcoming merge uh, the company upcoming Ethereum merge to sort of POS. Uh, I think that's something that a lot of people uh, are paying attention to, and and maybe if if you're able to as well, comment on the sort of Ethereum proof of work uh, fork that yeah. everyone keeps talking about as well. Sure. Yeah, we're super excited for the merge. I can't wait. It's it's something that's huge and historical, and um. Infura has been extremely diligent in being in step with the Ethereum Foundation and following along their roadmap, uh, taking their guidance on the right you know, configuration for client software. And in doing so, we've successfully merged with them the three recent test nets. So we had Robston in, I think it was June, at Sepolia in July, and just a few weeks ago, Gurley. And they've all gone really well for us. So technically, we feel confident that, yeah, we're up to speed. We're on par with the Ethereum Foundation. We're not expecting any surprises. And then in making our customers prepared, what we're trying to do is elevate communication. So we've had Twitter spaces. We've had community calls. So we talk about what the merge means, what's happening with Infura. We're updating our documentation. We're going to be issuing a few more blogs near the time for information for people to read and um, generally preparing people so they know what to expect. There will be changes to certain um, calls in terms of the JSON RPC methods that the Ethereum Foundation has shared, but we try to make people aware of those as well. So I think, I think we're really prepared and excited for it. And then <clears throat> in regards to that question around this, proof of stake. Um, Infura is uh, completely committed to following the Ethereum Foundation roadmap. We will be supporting the proof of stake and we will not be supporting any proof of work at any time. Yeah, I think yeah. that... Sorry, go ahead, Alex. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. Uh, that sort of echoes uh, what a lot of uh, other really key players in the space have been saying, uh, such as USDC and, and Circle and a number of other sort of key uh, foundational uh, infrastructure providers. Uh, it's something that we've talked a lot about as well. Um, I guess one, one thing that uh, some people have said in the past, I know you sort of talked about how the there's been a number of new sort of node providers, so things like uh, Alchemy, Pocket Network, uh, among many others. Um, I guess one criticism in the past of Infura was that it was kind of the dominant uh, sort of almost had a monopoly on, on the space. Uh, I'm kind of curious what, what you would say to that. I know you sort of mentioned that it's become more and more decentralized, but in a way there's almost a conflicting incentive where you want Ethereum to be fully decentralized by having lots of competitors. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're also sort of a for-profit entity, right? So you do want to maximize market share in a way. I guess, how do you guys, how does the team sort of think about that dynamic a little bit? Yeah. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, well, there are more node providers, so that's for decentralization. We are, in fact, increasing the plethora of networks that we have. So we don't just support Ethereum, and a lot of people think that's what Infura is. We support Polygon, Arbitrum, Optimism, I'm going to list them all now, if I can remember, Pam, Aurora, Near, Starknet, and Avalanche, and there's more in the pipe. So yeah. there's diversity in that, in what we bring to the ecosystem. And then just generally, the principle of decentralization is very close to our heart, and we totally believe in that. Um, but we also believe in reliability and adoption. So Infura is trying to help drive adoption for decentralized application builders 
that they have that reliability. They can focus on, you know, the use case for their app as opposed to worrying about keeping a node up. But again, circling back to decentralization, if you has ideas and thoughts that we are exploring around that, and I think there'll be more to come that you'll see in the months ahead around our views on decentralization. Yeah, that makes I didn't sense. hear the entire list, but it sounded like the most of those were Ethereum, like um, EVM compliant or like you know, well compliant. yeah all of them except for near is evm compatible and then starknet is a roll-up on l2 but they have slightly different prefix on their methods but yes they are mostly evm compatible we also have lot, point as well. yeah a lot of um and a lot of different proof of stake systems you see um like a lot of uh delegate you know delegate um companies or I don't know what they're called delegators basically where like you can delegate your tokens to them and they'll stake them on your behalf and they're almost like a chain agnostic right like they will you can do it you know in Algorand and Cosmos and Solana and whatever yeah. like they don't really care um, and I'm wondering with in Arbitrum's case yes you're supporting all these different EVM compliant chains but would you look to support any kind of chain um, that 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 needs your services or is it really sort of directionally towards the things that are Ethereum connected? Um, no, yeah, we we have sort of appeared to be slanted towards EVM compatible, but actually the drivers uh, behind our thought process on what networks to add is momentum. So like Avalanche C chain has high momentum, Starknet, and we are open to absolutely adding non-EVM networks that are high momentum and there are more in the pipe, but I just not have liberty to actually speak to those at the moment. But yeah, we're, we're not like, oh, we're married to EVM. We want to provide a one-stop shop to these endpoints that developers want because they want the biggest marketplace they can get. So if they can deploy all their apps on different chains with you know one provider, we see that as a value add, but not, millions of copycat EVM chains, you know, that's not really a value add. Interesting. Yeah. Why don't we um, turn to this recent announcement, um, mm -hmm. which is that you're joining Reddit, FTX Pay, and P2P, among others, um, on this new thing, a data availability committee. Committee. Gosh, I'm having trouble with that word. For off-chain labs, new chain, Arbitrum Nova. So, um, I think maybe let's let's just break that down a little bit because it was big news, but I, I think a lot of people may who are listening to the show might not fully understand everything I just said. <laughs> um, I, I totally so can you walk that. us through can you walk us through it? Yeah, because it is a bit confusing and what's the roll up and all of that. So I will. I'll walk you through it as best I can. So all as we know today, Arbitrum has a roll up referred to as Arbitrum One, which is an L2 above Ethereum. And so yeah bundle transactions and get to reduce cost. So they've now released a new chain and it's sort of product name is Nova and the actual chain is AnyTrust. And what's different is the consensus mechanism is as you said, a data availability uh, community consensus. And what that is, is it, it, it requires less trust. So each of the community members are holding the state of the chain and they only require two of the members at a minimum, like as many as they like can approve, but two at a minimum. So that's much less than the traditional BFT, which is looking at like say 14 out of 20 to approve. So that makes this roll up Nova faster because if you only need two approvals, then you can process your transactions faster. And then, that's one component that's super important. The second component is cost. So um, because it requires less trust, they are also requiring only to write the actual hash of the batch, the transaction batch. So basically not the whole transaction like they do with L1 and yeah. that reduces the cost. So. I can give you an example because I was chatting with the Arbitrum folks about this. Like, what is the cost difference? What does it mean? And so Sushi is on Arbitrum 1 and is also on the, the, the Nova Any Trust chain. And so on Arbitrum 1, Sushi transaction is around 21 cents. 
whereas on this new chain, it's three and a half cent. So that's almost a six X saving. So then you're moving into the territory where the likes of Reddit can go, well, maybe compute community points can work at that price point. You know, we're starting to get lower and the speed and stuff like that. So, um, and gaming as well. They're, they're sort of like apps to provide faster transactions at lower cost in this roll-up and it's on L1. And if anything goes AWOL, like any of the committee members, uh, you know, there was issues, uh, Arbitrum have redundancy where they basically on that chain reverse to optimistic roll-up consensus mechanism. And so it's confirmed with the security of L1 until such time as the data committee is back. So we as a member are hosting a, a node which is capturing state and we are, uh, as a committee member, we approve. And, and that's basically our role at the moment. And I guess the key thing is, what does this all mean for Deep Web 3 applications? And if you can, you know, reduce the confirmation time for transactions and, you know, reduce the, um, the cost, then you're opening up a whole new world of potential um, you know, transactions, right? But not not only financial transactions, but as you point, more social gaming transactions. Because, you know, if you're in the midst of a, you know, a quest in some play to earn game and you're part of a guild and you need to, you know, do a transaction, it's helpful if it's instant and costs very little. And that's probably true, frankly, for all transactions. But, you know, some, some of them don't require instantaneous settlement and others do. And um, being able to you know, reduce that is, is really important. I think probably a lot of people who, who listen to this program and maybe in general are interested in crypto um, don't don't fully understand the the technical implementation that goes into making this all work. Like they understand the idea of a blockchain, um, you know, as a ledger of transactions and, you know, some form of process of reaching consensus, adding new blocks, I think. But um, the idea of shaving time, shaving costs and rolling up, like doing the roll up and, and um, you know, the L2 concept, um, I think is such an important one. Um, Sharon, you know, we, we've spoken about this before on the show, the idea of what, what, what is going to be required in order for Ethereum to scale and for, and for L1s in general. And we've spoken about how there's definitely a um, scarcity of block space for transactions because there's clearly a lot of demand from, you know, web uh, application developers to, to use up um, block space in the Ethereum network. Um, and so they've gone to other L1s. Um, but this idea of you know, figuring out ways to scale up the existing networks is really important. And it doesn't just happen on its own, right? There's companies and um, stakeholders and you know, developers and everybody kind of behind the scenes making that happen. So very interesting. Thank you for that explanation. Very welcome. <clears throat> Did you ever take a look at the Reddit um, communities that are supporting these coins? Um, you know the way Redis does karma, so you get yeah. karma. So what they're doing in this case is it's community points, and it's just in two groups at the moment. Uh, cryptocurrency is one group, and Fortnite is the other. And hmm. the community points in crypto are called moons, of course, <laughs> and the points in Fortnite are called bricks. And I don't really get that because I don't play Fortnite, but maybe you do. Um, but, uh, and it's a really nice uh, user experience because I tried it out where you just log on to your Reddit app and you join either of those groups. And then in your uh, profile, you'll see a vault and you set up a vault and that wallet is open directly on the Nova AnyTrust chain. So you're right there here now. So it's quite interesting to see how it goes if people find it easy to use and what, you know, where it takes them. And it's really in beta with just these two groups, but there is an option. I saw a wait list where people can sign up. Do you want your group to support community points? So it could spread if people like it, but that remains to be seen. Yeah, well, the Karma one's a great example because, you know, A, it's like a, when you, when you, you know, um, I don't even know what the expression is. I don't really use Reddit, but like the idea of like giving someone karma, it's like a nothing thing. It's like, hey, good work for you. And like, if you have to go through some process where it's going to cost like $50 to like approve some transaction on an L1 and take 10 minutes, like you're never going to do that. So it's like a micro yeah. transaction, right? It's just the kind of thing where if you want to like integrate Web3 tools into regular everyday applications, 
then you need this kind of solution, right? That's the point I was I was trying to make. There. Um, Andrew, I know I interrupted you earlier. Did you have something you want to ask? Yeah, no, I think uh, the one thing I, I really wanted to sort of uh, talk about because it's, it's been big in the news is the this whole idea of, uh, we talked about sort of the forking into an Ethereum proof of work, um, which I think a lot of people sort of know is not uh, really an existential risk to Ethereum. Uh, whereas one thing that some people have been really worried about is this is this idea that uh, Ethereum could almost f fork into like an OFAC compliant uh, version where there would actually be censorship at the base level. Um, so I, I'm just kind of curious whether you think that's a, a realistic risk um, and, and just sort of how, how, how you guys are thinking about it. Yeah, just before you answer that question, I just want to clarify like OFAC, um, the Office of the Foreign um, you know, whatever it's called in the in the US government. Basically, it's the, the, the group in the government that's able to sanction foreign actors for doing things that are illegal or for suspected of doing things that are illegal. And um, the recent news is that Tornado Cash, which is this open source technology project, um, the wallet associated with that was sanctioned, um, which is, I think, a first. Typically, uh, OFAC sanctions individuals or institutions that are suspected of um, doing something illegal. And in this case, the argument is that it's sort of a credibly neutral technology tool that's used by lots of different kinds of people, kind of like, say, the internet, um, and that that um, is an example of how potentially decentralized uh, tooling and networks can actually become subject to, um, to laws and regulations. And I think the question is basically, um, you know, could this apply to the main net, to Ethereum itself, and then what's the role for Infura and all that, um, if, if that came to it? Mm. Well, that's a huge question. And I think all of us are sort of grappling with that because it's such early days. It was kind of a shock that OFAC came out with a list of addresses. Like you wouldn't have thought that. And so, you know, we are all in a period of adoption and people are opening their eyes and seeing what can happen. And, and I suppose this is an outcome for that. But um whether there's actually a fork to a regulatory chain and if everybody supports that, I think that's a huge unknown. I think there's an awful lot of panic because there's so much change with the merge and then this suddenly OFAC are doing this and people are sort of anxious. Um, but we haven't formulated a policy or you know anything because we're sort of waiting to see how the chips land a little bit ourselves. Um, but yeah, it is it is an interesting time. Um, but our focus really is lasered on the merge, getting that right. That's the most important thing because it's going to make such a big impact to the whole ecosystem. And you know, is OFAC going to continually come out with new restrictions? I don't know. But we can't just be distracted by one off. We need to keep our eye on the ball on the merge. And that really is where all our energy is focused at the moment, Andrew. And we haven't really arrived at any conclusions about anything else. Yeah, I think that's really well said. I think um, we've, we've talked a lot about how sort of our shared vision, uh, at least mine and Alex's, is that the back ends uh, are always going to be fully decentralized. Uh, and then there'll be more censorship over time, we think, on the front ends, or at least the things that are sort of consumer facing. Um, and, uh, and and maybe there'll be a variety of different front ends. And, and so we'll sort of see what happens there, just given that, uh, obviously, fully decentralized protocols can't really, uh, can't really be, I guess, sanctioned in a way or turned off. Uh, but you can obviously take down the, the URL of Tornado Cash and make it very difficult for sort of people to use it. Um, yeah, so I, anyways, I, I guess just overall, I, I agree. I think the, the merge is, we, we've we talked nonstop about the merge on this podcast. <laughs> are you excited for it? Like, are you optimistic about it? Yeah, so we actually have a prediction market on SX about the merge. Uh, and the price uh, on the prediction market, it was around 60-40 that the merge would happen. And then now recently it's gone to about 85, 15 wow. uh, and, and there's not even that much liquidity anymore. So people are very, very bullish on it, um, which is interesting. I've never seen, uh, this is like the highest in terms of implied probability that I've seen. And, and from talking to people who sort of work with core developers, it sounds like they're incredibly confident that it's going through sort of giving yeah. you like a 95% plus sort of estimated probability. So um it's really great. I mean, I think uh, one of the things that Alex and I have talked a lot about is about how it sort of totally changes the dynamics of owning uh, the 
like ether asset itself, given yeah. that it now has a yield, uh, the sort of inflation rate or supply increase goes down by 90%. Uh, so it's just, it's kind of a new era in, in, in Ethereum. So. Yeah, I mean, there's like, as I see it, there's three elements of the merge, which are really interesting. Number one is um, the energy use was going to decline significantly. And um, that's going to, I hope, eliminate any criticism of blockchain and Web3 as somehow unsustainable. I think that argument is actually baseless, even in talking about Bitcoin, but I think it'll hopefully put that to rest. Um, number two is that uh, I believe that for the reasons you've described and, and others, that it'll help to increase the utility of the network, um, make it better for uh, developers and for users. So that's pretty cool. And then obviously that's the third thing that Andrew just mentioned, which is you're going to just reduce the net new supply. Yeah. And that's going to hit the market, but the demand function is not really going to change. I mean, you could make the case that maybe the main chain handles less, um, you know, fewer transactions because they're all happening at the L2 like roll up stage and it's only uses a final settlement layer, but that's, we're so early. That's that kind of comment I think is really premature. I, I think the net effect is you're going to have, less supply, constant to slash growing demand. And that's going to obviously, you know, increase the price or not, not, it's not saying it will automatically, but it's likely to improve the investment case for Ethereum as, a, as an asset in and of itself. So, you know, I think that that's um, three pretty compelling reasons to, you know, be focused on what's going on uh, with the merge. And uh, obviously we think that uh, Infura um, is a big, big part of that. And it's been uh, Really interesting, Sharon, hearing from you today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, we're out of time for this conversation, but we really enjoy it. Good luck with everything. Good luck with the merge. Uh, maybe we can have a post-merge uh, you know, debrief um, after merger mania has subsided a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Fingers <laughs> to, crossed. Yeah. To talk excited. about it. Yeah. But uh, good, good luck to you and the 430,000 developers that you support on Infura and all the happy customers like AY and others who... Uh, you know, have used you guys. Um, you're doing great stuff for the community. We appreciate it. So thanks and take care. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Andrew. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The information contained herein does not constitute an offer or solicitation by anyone in the United States or in any other jurisdiction in which such an offer or solicitation is not authorized or to any person to whom it is unlawful to make such an offer or solicitation. Prospective investors who are not residents in Canada should contact their financial advisor to determine whether securities of the funds may be lawfully sold in their jurisdiction.